Daniel O'Brien here. Today I'm talking with Nick Huggins. Thanks for joining me today, Nick. You're welcome, mate. Okay, so today I want to talk about regenerative agriculture. You've had a lot of experience in this space, setting up farms and working with farms. So give me a little bit of your background of how you got into, I suppose, farming, agriculture, regenerative agri- agriculture. Well, it's sort of come about um, in my horticulture days on the Gold Coast where I was up there, you know, we were doing jobs anywhere from small backyards to large sort of developments. And I just had this feeling that something wasn't right. And even with working with our clients, um, trying to do the right thing in the sense of not using sprays and pesticides in places, um, people just wanted to see the grass green and the garden looking good. They didn't really care how it was done. They weren't really conscious of the fact of organics and that type of stuff. So I started to try to implement that. And then long story short, I did a – I just typed in in vegetable growing and growing – it was more so for myself just to, to sustain myself. And that was sort of in my mid-20s, I think, late, late 20s. Um, anyway, typed in vegetable growing, got sort of, as you know, down the rabbit hole with certain things as, as the internet does and found this bloke named Jeff Lawton down the road from me um, uh, at um, down near Byron Bay at the Shannon and uh, went did a permaculture design course and then basically left that and have gone, drove out of the Shannon, which is a tiny little enclave in, in the middle of the hills there around Byron Bay and on the Lismore Road and gone, I can't go back to doing this. So again, long story short, just basically went back, sold up everything um, and then made it my mission to go and find everybody within that sort of space at permaculture, back to sustainability space back then uh, and get to know them. And particularly people like Jeff and, you know, you interviewed Darren Doherty a few weeks back and, you know, Darren and I work closely on projects and still collaborate on certain things. Um, and so it just went from there and I bought myself some land down uh, near Canberra, just west of Canberra, uh, east of Canberra, sorry, um, between Batons Bay and Canberra, a little place called Tarrago, an elevation of about uh, 700 metres. So it had that sort of climate which wasn't Queensland, which was um, had the seasons I uh, had snowfall from time to time. So so from that, sort of having that space and then then helping people design their farms, and, you know, you and I have got a lot of connections within that with farms I've designed and people applying the chicken caravan to their places. Um, and so from that, it just I just met more and more people and, and, and who were into this and um, to where I am now, uh, still working in, in the space and, I've sort of had to retreat back a little bit because it um, it all got a bit too consuming there for a while and just had to really sort of come back to myself and um, and work out what my needs were in all of this and because there was so much happening out there in the that regenerative agriculture space that, um, you know, there was uh, people preaching permaculture, there were people preaching this and biodynamics and it's just had to sort of sit back while my child was born to sort of sit, sit you know, have some retrospect and go, what can I, like, like Darren's done with Regerians, he's just basically pulled all the best things and put them together and, and is constantly open to new ideas. That's been the big thing for me is just not being um, dogmatic about one approach or too preachy about one approach. Um, and look, I, I'm guilty of that. I've done lots of work around permaculture and it can be very, very preachy. Um, but that's sort of stepping back and looking at what are the important things for all of us and just being able to cooperate and find these people and bring them in and work with them and and find what are the good pieces of all of it um, has been really valuable. Yeah, fantastic. And one of the things I've found in a lot of these interviews is the mindset, having the open mind. And for a lot of people, that was the change to them to go, hang on, what else is out there? How else can we do this? And, and obviously for you, that started with, with your landscaping, go, how else could we do this? And then Jeff Lawton yeah. and then to where you are today. Uh, yeah. So one, one of the things I want to talk to you about, I, I know you've talked about compaction. So on you've got on, fa- on farms, compaction can be a problem. So let's just say, I don't know anything about farming. Tell me what is compaction and what are the... Why is that a problem and what causes it? Mate, uh, my personal belief, and it's my belief here, um, is that compaction is one of the greatest threats to our climate. Um, 
in working through the years, I was managing a farm within the uh, Maloon catchment, which through the Maloon Institute over there uh, just uh, east of Canberra. So that's quite famous for a lot of Peter Andrews' work. Um, so I managed the farm over there for quite a few years, and in that catchment, they're actually doing that rehabilitation work that Peter Andrews is so famous for. Um, and in that process, I've learned a lot through a guy called um, Dave Tongway. And Dave Tongway used to work for CSIRO, and he came up with a um, basically a way of being able to put together figures which can show you exactly where your landscape is at the time and infiltration-wise, so it's basically water getting into the soil. Now, I won't get into all the details of it, but landscape function assessment, which he calls it, so LFA, you might hear the acronym sometimes. So LFA, landscape function assessment, basically looks at a whole raft of things. So the plant stability, a bit like the holistic management framework where it looks at um, the four key uh, landscape functions. So water, mineral cycle, solar, um, and you put me on the spot here, Dan, mineral, water, mineral, solar, and community dyna dynamics. So looking at the distribution of different perennials and annuals throughout the system. And so in that, um, everywhere I go, doesn't, I mean, having that sort of, um, the lens to look through, whether it be permaculture or holistic management, sort of seeing the landscape in a different way, has opened it up to look at um, when we see water running off and not infiltrating, um, and thinking that uh, it should be in the rivers and not back on in the landscape. Uh, and one thing that sort of Peter Andrews' work told me that, would, you know, once they've they've started to um, slow the water down to the landscape, then the landscape naturally percolates that water, and rather than having annual um, fl uh, flowing creeks, you actually have perennial flowing creeks. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Yeah. And... Within that, again, this is where it becomes, I'm not sort of too dogmatic. See, I, I didn't like a lot of the, Peter Andrews does some fantastic work. Every time, and this is where I suppose I like to question the status quo, was that I, I'm going, this is all great to work on the creeks and it's very noble work, but shouldn't we be back up the top of the landscape where the water runs and comes back into this? Because mm. if we fix that, then this should naturally heal itself. Yep. You following me there? Yes, that's right. Yeah, because yeah, it gets in the creeks because it runs off a hill, down the hill, and at the bottom of a hill there's a creek. Yeah, back in so. back into the water, so it actually finds its infiltration points to get back into, mm. um, and the discharge points where it comes back down into, and that's what discharge is basically like springs. Yeah. So when springs need an infiltration point to that water to get in, and discharge somewhere else, and that's where. I suppose uh, ho holistic management was another paradigm shift for me in doing that course. Um, and I studied with quite a few practitioners, um, Graham Hand and, and, and a, a great personal friend of mine, George Gundry, who was actually died a few years back. He was my mentor. and He owned 5,000 acres just to the back of me in Tarrago. And, um, and so even through just looking at each square metre and going, how can I improve the landscape function of this square metre? Because I've been through it all and I still use some of these things like the key line plough, you know. Um, all those types of uh, disciplines, right from yeomans through to biodynamics. And if I just go, if I can improve this square metre and get that water to infiltrate. Um, and it, a lot of them are looking at now is, you know, okay, we're getting less rainfall, but are we actually utilising that rainfall falling on its spot? Mm. You know, if 10% is infiltrating and the rest is then running off, then of course we're gonna be in droughts. And I think droughts are actually confined to, my personal belief, the droughts are actually confined to the farm. Okay. You know, I've seen a lot, I've just written, I haven't posted yet, but I've just written an article which has triggered my mind about this compaction. And we were talking about the other week there on the phone. I, I drive so many roads, I travel so many places in, in consulting and mm. One thing I see is the road edge between the road and the farmer's fence. And this bit of edge I'm talking about is the edge that I travel quite a bit, which is from Bega on the New South Wales far coast through to Canberra. And that's still now on the Snowy Mountains Highway. It gets grazed intermittently by graziers and drovers running their cattle through those roadsides and grazing them. And we haven't had a fantastic year this year on the, this sort of southeast coast area and up in the tablelands because it's just been too bloody cold 
like we've had, you know, abundance of snow, but as soon as it gets to there, it just basically falls a snow, snowfall, and then we're in a bit of a rain shadow because of the, the success of the snow this season. Yeah. Um, and so that area had a bit of rain coming up into September, and then also had some good snowfalls in through October. And that actually got grazed mid-October. And travelling up there last week, I actually taken some photos, just you know, looking at my feet, looking out, and assessing some plants and looking at how they're, how they're travelling. They're stepping across two millimetres across a wire into the farmer's fence, which is a dust bowl virtually. And I'm just going, well, if this is getting grazed, is it the actual drought or is it the management? Mm. Now, I thought of another article to write the other day was, you know, I see it through local land services posts. So in Victoria, we have what we call local land services, which is like our extension office, right, from ag departments. And it's always drought management. So I'm actually going to write an article which has got drought management crossed out, and I'm going to put into the bottom management drought. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And I think that's one big key thing is here. It's lack of management that is, that is the key. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. So yeah. w- w- from from the e- edge of the from the edge of the road to the farmer's fence, there's plenty of grass. Um, and as you well, said, I estimated it, yeah. in, in the paddocks. Sorry, Kate, off Dan. Yeah. But in the paddocks, in a, I reckon there was about probably 200 kilos of dry matter per hectare. Yeah. Out on the out on the, the edge between the road, and I tried to pick a spot that wasn't too favourable. Wasn't too favourable for water running off the road because that again is going to obviously increase the amount of water yes. to that area. Yeah. So I tried to pick an area which was sort of just a bit elevated, but then running off either side. Mm. Um, so there's 200 meter, 200 um, kilos of dry matter per hectare in the farmer's side. I estimate there's only about two to three thousand kilos of dry matter per hectare on the road verge. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And the only difference is management and compaction well, or, or what's, just, what, what, what's, the, what's the difference? We obviously know there's stock running there. There's only limited, well, there is in that yeah. scenario, there is some stock from various times running down um, yeah. the roadside, um, but obviously not as much. So w- what is the actual difference that we can see? It's high, high, high density number of animals there for a short time. Yeah. And that could even be improved, that road grazing, because I'm, I would watch these, these guys pushing these cattle along. Yeah. And often the cattle are actually walking probably too fast because they're actually trying to get that next bit of green pick. Yes. Right? So they're actually not getting all the veggies. They're sort of getting the meat and potatoes, but then forgetting the veggies. Yes, yeah. So they're getting that. And so animal condition, I don't, I don't take much into that, but the animal condition could probably suffer there because they're walking all the time. So you've had to slow them up a bit more. Yeah. put more compaction, more manure and more urine at that spot, and then move them on. So that bit of road verge could nearly be getting 300 plus days of recovery. Yes, yeah. Where the farmer's paddock is, and this is a bit of a paradox shift here too, is that that farmer's paddock is probably understocked, right? Yeah. So understocked but overgrazed. Okay. So it's got less animals running over a larger space, just smashing every plant that comes and rears its head to recover. Yeah. And that's the big thing. And that's where this compaction thing too becomes because you alluded to the fact when we talked before before recording here about I've just st- finished a job up in Canberra, which I'll post up soon on, onto YouTube. Um, and so if you imagine coming out of Canberra, out of Civic, heading towards Parliament House... There's a big roundabout there, which has got some 100-year-old cypress. And so the ACT government uh, called us into, how can we save these trees? So you imagine maybe 60 years of mowers running over that thing around in circles and trucks driving up onto it, council trucks driving up onto it and packing that soil down. Um, Then the mowers running around just cutting dust and weeds because there's no ground cover. And that compaction has just... um, decrease the amount of oxygen in, in available in the soil for that, those trees to be able to symbiotically relate to the fungi in the soil. So the mm. fungi can't survive in a no oxygen environment. Yes. And so water can't infiltrate either. Yes. And I mean, it, it wasn't really the best time of year to do it. You know, the best time of year to do it is in a, gr- in a, in a good season, is to go to a good season and go, all the elements are working for us, moisture's in the air, 
we've got good growth, then we can come in and do it. But yes. usual government, the wisdom is to actually be reactive yeah. because the funding's there now to to get, sort the stuff out. Yeah, okay. And so it's not just the stock that's a problem. In our also our urban settings, compaction is a problem um, with just having needless mowing. Like I've seen, I, actually, the day I was there doing that work, I, I was actually watching this guy mow pure dust on a huge big front deck of boater, yeah. mowing dust. Yeah. Didn't need to be there, but because the, the obviously the ACT government need to keep people working is he's out there cutting dust and yeah. what sort of life is that for a guy just demoralising, cutting lawns with, with just for dust. Yeah, right, just so he can yeah. tick the box to say, yep, I've done that part. We're done. Or, and there was a yeah. few, few weeds that popped their head up and I've cut them in, in my yeah. rows, so... So, so in, 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 in that landscape. urban setting, what I'm interested in, so you say like it's had 60 years of compaction of mowers and trucks. Um, in that urban setting, and there could be people that aren't farmers that go, hey, I do have a backyard and I'll never put stock on it and I do want to run my mower and have my, my big trees or something. How do they do it differently? What's the alternative there? Well, some of the best... So in my past life with with landscaping we just do a lot of high rises on the gold coast and we basically be laying turf onto basically beach sand okay right yeah. but we put irrigation into it too so they'd yeah. be constantly irrigated yeah and we'd be maintaining it and mowing it right mm. so it's like the um it's like the cattle grazing the side of the road we can go to some really poor conditions and improve it just by infiltration of water so yeah. it might be coring or even just walking around with those spiky shoes on your, on your back lawn. Yes. Um, but it, it might be the dog. It might be the dog, just one dog on, you know, a small area yeah. running 365 days a year yeah. um, will do a lot of damage as opposed to 365 dogs for one day. Yes, yeah. Cause some t- and it's interesting using the dog example because sometimes – you think compaction, you think, okay, I've got an area that I want compacted. It could be somewhere we're putting a driveway or, or a yeah. roadway at the front of the shed. And sometimes compaction in my mind, like it's a big machine with a roller on the front that's really heavy, but the dog, yeah. the dog's not that heavy, but it's, it's the consistency, as you said, the one dog every day running over. And, and it's hard to wrap your head around, and I'm sort of going, really, would the dog actually compact that much? But it, explain to me what's happening, because it's not the weight of the dog. It's not like, oh, mate, this dog is so heavy. But what's mm. happening is, is the soil sort of springing up a bit as it's got some grass, and the dog just pushes that down. Like, what's actually going on? Because it's not, it's not the, weight, the sheer weight of the dog that's, that's making it compacted. So think of it in terms of um, as the roots of the plants being like uh, reinforcing steel and concrete. Yep. Right. You take the reinforcing steel out of concrete, you drive over it, the thing just breaks up. Yes. Right. And it's the same thing too with with the soil. Um, and this is not this is not complicated soil science. It's pretty mm. pretty simple. Yeah. That as that dog keeps trampling that grass and keeps knocking it down. Um, that starts to die back, depending on what grass it is. Yes. I mean, even kaikuyus and the coochers that are pretty hardy will tend to get knocked back pretty pretty heavily. Mm. But so it's a constant repetition, so the, the roots start to die back, and then the root spaces are taken up, and they're basically compacted down, and they, they, they die back, yes. right? Yeah. And as they, there's no more roots growing in there, everything just starts to, it's like a lasagna, just starts to compress down and compress down mm. until you have some rainfall happening and then all of a sudden the rain's hitting the top of the soil. You've got bare soil now. Yes. And you've got a, all those fine particles that are coming to the surface of the course are moving down and the fine particles are moving to the top. Yeah. And you get capping. That's another big one in paddocks too is capping, so exposed soil. Mm. Um, you know, my big one of my big mantras is 100% ground cover for 100% of the time. It doesn't matter what it is. Yes. Just making sure that anything that's going to hit that rainfall coming down or irrigation is going to be you know um basically taken up by that um that ground cover yes. and slowly percolated down through the soil mm. and so i mean there's a whole other raft of complications to it but that's pretty much it in a nutshell and i mean it can be someone walking from 
A to B across rather than following the path around, they just walk straight across, which is you know, notorious at schools. The schools know another thing too, compassionate schools. Yeah, yeah, the, the old the, the goat track. The, yeah, they've, they've, exactly. They've worn the, the goat track across, they've cut the corner on, on the oval or the path of the. Yeah. 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 And so that's what compaction is all about. And so when we look at these paddocks in a regenerative sense, it's in, in looking at through the lens of landscape function, um, is once that water hits, if we're getting 10 mils of rain, yeah. so one mil on one square metre equals one litre. Yes. So if we have 10 mils of rain on a square metre, that's 10 litres. Yes. How much that 10 litres is actually infiltrating and getting into the ground? Yeah, yeah. So, and so there are tools out there like the Yeoman's Plough, which can, can, you know, you can speed up succession to get that water into it. Yeah. But as, you know, as Darren Doughty argues, that there are other ways and means if you actually do have the capability to bring animals in to, to, to do it and yeah. many others out there professing just to to look at it from a purely from a holistic context and go well what's your best bang for your buck yes. is it bringing the neighbors the neighbors cattle into your into your small backyard area throwing some hay down yeah and letting them disturb it and then yeah. taking them off so, ju- it so to just to explain that because and i'm asking these questions from I suppose a point of view if someone's like, hang on, I don't know anything about farming. I, I've, I've got my little backyard. The previous owners, or it might have been me, I've had my dog running around every day. Mm. Um, so if I'm bringing the next door neighbor's cows in, I'm thinking, hang on, those cows are way heavier than me walking on there. It's way heavier than my dog walking on there. Aren't mm. they going to make it more compacted? Can you explain what how the cows are actually going to benefit in that scenario well look any animal mate you could have sheep you could have it could be as i said it could be 300 dogs you can bring 300 dogs in and yeah. do exactly the same thing um it's purely that by putting ground cover down like just i've done plenty of times with changing the composition of um the pasture rather yeah. than reseeding yeah. i've gone down to a berry and thrown seed down right yeah. over the top yeah and thrown hay over it, put electric fence around it, thrown cows in there with water at the same time. Yeah. And let them high densities of manure, urine, incorporation. So using and once animals have got a really jostle for um, position to eat. Yes. That's when the disturbance happens. Yes. You have a large paddock where no one's there's no competition to eat. Yeah. Right. You don't get that, and you can you can really. Um, bring it out to a larger scale, larger scale or, or zoom it into a smaller scale and get high disturbance. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> the best place, you know, every time I go to a farm, the best best bit of um, grass I see is in the cattle yards. Yes. Because the cattle the cattle come in for a short amount of time. Yeah. It's if, if it's on a it's if it's on a dirt surface, high urine, high manure, high compaction or high high disturbance, mm. so compaction disturbance, yeah. and then they're out. They might be not there for three or four months. Yes. And they're gone. Yeah. So what you were saying, um, with someone with a backyard, they could put those spikes on the shoes and <coughs> and bring that level of disturbance. But essentially, if they brought a few sheep or cattle in, that's sort of what the sheep and cattle are doing. They're pushing that um, the grass or whatever further into the ground. Because yeah. um, it's sort of counterintuitive. There's one got thought of going, hang on, that's actually making it more compacted. But mm. you're... The most important element is you're taking them off. We're not leaving them there for the next yep. year, and it's that recovery time. Yep. Um, so then it can recover. You, you get yep. them on there and get them off there. So that's in a, a backyard setting, in or, or or someone that may not normally have livestock. I, I want to talk about a solution. So one of these paddocks that you've been driving down this road we can see the amount of grass in between the edge of the road and the fence. Let's just say I buy one of these farms tomorrow, which is pretty well a dirt dirt bowl. I don't know anything about farming. Mm. You've just told me I've probably got a compaction issue. Where do I start to to get that back up to speed? Oh, I've got a compaction issue, and let's just say I've got 50 acres. Well, for starters, you're not alone because everyone's got a compaction issue. It doesn't matter who you are. Yeah. You know? <laughs> um, and this is this is the great travesty I see. I mean, I fly a lot too when in going to different consultations. And I look down and I think about the places that I've ma- had an effect on and the places that other people, um, other colleagues and uh, that have had effects on and you just go, 
it's just such a small percentage. Mm, it yes. really is. Yeah. Um, I was at. I'll, I'll, I'll preface that by saying I was at a consultation just before, um, just before October. Must be in October. Not too far from Goulburn. So my my farms are Tarago, east of Canberra, and Goulburn's not too far north from there. And I run a course up there, a two day course, and some people who were on the course got me out to their farm. I'd been talking about tree systems. That's something we can sort of broach a bit later on too. And uh, when I got to the farm, the first thing they want to do is take me out to the problem. And so I don't, I just, I don't want to go see the problem. I know what the problem is. Yeah. Let's just walk there and let's just see what the rest of the farm is like. Mm. And that's sort of telling me about their history. And they weren't by any way farmers. They basically bought land uh, and were doing it not a bad job in it, but could do a lot better. Um, and the first question, I, I just listened. The whole, and that's a big skill in consulting is just listening because you pick up a lot in just listening. Mm. And so walking up there, I'm just staring at my feet the whole time. I'm looking at the compaction and I don't even have to test it. I can just see it, you know, mm. because the, the plants will actually show you how compacted the soil is. And yep. the, the actual um, community dynamics, which is, a, a, which is a holistic management term, which looks at what distribution of species you've got in, in the pasture, um, when I look at that, I'm looking down, it's just a monoculture of just annuals, which mm. is okay if you've got plenty of rain. And if you live in sort of that sort of southern Victoria area, we get that sort of Mediterranean climate. But up there, you're relying on summer rainfalls, a mm. bit of winter, but a lot of summer rainfall. And it's purely annualised. So you're looking at your C4 grasses, which are your summer active grasses. Yeah. You want to make sure you've got plenty of those for that yeah. growing season through summer. And um, the first question I said is, um, so... What's the the what, Just tell me what's your decision making behind how you rotate them. And they were just rotating cattle. How do you? What's the decision making you got behind moving the cattle? Oh well, look, when I think they've had enough, I'll move them on to the next paddock. I'm like, okay. And so the whole conversation went right away from tree systems back to looking at landscape function. How can we increase that 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 function? Um, and so that's some of the big again management drought. Mm. It really is a management drought. Yeah. So when – and this is another good thing. I'll, I'll, I'll share some insight into you too because I'd done a full report after them to, to tell them or suggest what sort of some things they need to do. And some of these things that I suggested they do didn't require any action at all. Mm. They drove to Canberra each day to go to work and it required listening to – a book by Gay Brown, which talks about um, uh, pasture cropping, or that's that's uh, cover cropping, right? Yeah. And then the other one was looking at a holistic management book, and then another one was for me to come out and spend a day with them, just doing some quadrants, so basically some test areas, and looking at their pasture, and just so we got a benchmark to work from. Mm. Um, and I hadn't heard back from them because they just wanted to know, and pure, we we're working through the process on the day after we'd been outside and going, well, um, what can we do? Can we get some compost in? I said, well, for us, you've got, you've got mobile compost facilities in cattle running around doing the job. Mm. We just need a small energizer and put them in, in some water and we're, we're away. Yeah. <clears throat> what about compost teas? I heard you do compost teas. I said, yeah, I do. But it's in parallel with grazing and management. Yeah. But I haven't heard back from them. Yeah. And this is quite common with consultants is that, <coughs> sorry, Dan, once you start to recommend doing nothing mm. and stepping back from it all, yeah. it's just like, this guy's got no idea. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. The, the world is and like the, the hustle, the grind, the come on, let's let's make yeah. it happen. And yeah. I was guilty of that. And then I think Darren, I think Darren Doherty mentioned that too in a, in a podcast a while ago. You know, we've all been guilty of just going out and getting shit done like we could do it. Bring yeah. some machines in, bring this in, and 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 we've got the solutions. Yeah. But some of the time, it's just walking, just saying stop. Yeah. Stop doing that. <clears throat> I think is the biggest paradigm shift. Mm. And when you sort of talk about what can people do when they buy that fifty acres and they've got compaction. Yeah. And there's some other things too, especially with my property. So when we bought the property up there, two thousand and ten, eleven, I think it was. Um, I chose this and give the, property selection is a big thing and I do a lot of pre-purchase inspections for people and um, some people we might be on the fifth or sixth property looking at it 
and they fall in love with lots of the aesthetic things, but don't. There's one property which was south of Canberra, um, in the Tindery Ranges, sort of down towards Breadbow, and it's just love grass country. Like, mate, it is as thick as cat, hair on a cat's back. And for those who don't know love grass, um, it is probably one of the worst grasses getting around for as far as it dominating the landscape. But it only dominates the landscape because of the management that's there. Mm. So now I said to these people, look, if you want to be really noble and, and, and have a noble pursuit and regenerate this landscape, it's going to take you 60 years. Okay. You know, this is a couple hundred acres yeah. and pretty, pretty hilly country. Or you could move to an area that had already had some of the, the good traits to it. When I bought my property, <coughs> the um, real estate was trying to show me the the views, and the vistas around towards Goulburn and back towards Canberra. I'm, I'm looking uh, the other way. I'm going, well, that valley there has water running into it. Calculated how much water runs in through it, and I knew that this is it has no great views by any means, but it has water which is the fundamental thing when looking to design a property. Mm. And so when you talk about that compaction on a 50-acre scale is, look, is the property suited to what you want to do? Mm. Forget the compaction and forget all of that. Yeah. Can you actually marry up, you know, if we want to do, and I've talked plenty of people out of putting chickens on their properties, Yeah. you know, for lots of other reasons, purely for the fact that um, they weren't prepared to manage it the way mm. they need to be managed. Yes, yeah. I've seen some people with some fantastic ch- you know, chicken caravans, you know, Shane Amani from Applebox Farm, formerly Gippsland Free Range in, in Gippsland, you know, grass of abundance. Yes. Or I've seen others with chicken caravans who are just set stocking their chickens in that spot and not moving them. Yeah, that's right. <clears throat> and so, again, management drought. Mm. So when it comes to this whole compaction issue, it, some of the things we can do is just um, control the variables. Yeah. And one big thing too, in, particularly in our farm, is that um, keeping stock out is our big problem. Okay. You know, everyone, if you actually go and whoever's listening can go along tomorrow and drive look along, along a fence line of a farmer and look which way the, the, the fences are tilting. Yeah. Properties that I've managed in the past in our own property, all the fences face inwards. Okay. Because the stock are trying to get in to eat the grass on the other side. Yes. Where the stock isn't managed well and it's set stocked, we talked about before the roadside, um, you know, all the fences are facing the opposite way. They're facing <laughs> outwards because they want to get the grass on the other side. That's very interesting, that. It's very interesting. That now, have you seen it before? I probably, ha- I probably have and got, okay, whatever. But having the context now, I know even today I'm going to be driving going, right, let's look at these... Um, yeah, particular farms which I know of go, hey, they're going to do a good job. I'm now going to observe, hey, let's see which way their, their fences are tilting. Yeah, and, it, and that's a pretty basic <laughs> measurement scale, isn't it? Go. That- there's, a, there's a book out there called uh, What Weeds Tell Us. It's a fairly old book. I don't, don't think it's even in publication anymore. But it actually looked at, um, you know, like Danny lines, I think, were a calcium deficiency. So, mm-hmm. so many weeds and things like uh, love grass and serrated tussock are basically um, indications of one poor management, <clears throat> a very infertile soil, but also too that the the soil has been fairly disturbed. Yeah. So either ploughing it up or uh, it's had running off come into the place, and it's basically there to they're very shallow rooted, fibrous root systems holding yeah. that soil together. So yeah. they're there for a purpose. Yeah. Then you see to see the tap roots, you know, so you can. Like the fences, one they're, they're the indicators, the landscape yeah. indicators. Yeah, and the weeds is also to the landscape indicators too. Yeah, and I've been I've been one of those people who's gone and actually grabbed weeds to bring them onto my property, add some more diversity to it. Mm. Um, like a like a thistle. Yeah, and that probably I was talking about before, um, where the people didn't call me back. Um, yeah. we're walking out there, and the husband's chopping thistles down as we're going out and chipping them out. I'm going, what are you doing that for? Yeah. Oh, because we can't have weeds. And it's purely an aesthetic thing. It's purely yes. because they, they don't think the neighbours, oh, they've got problems over there with weeds. Mm. The weeds are sort of the first, if you're going into that 50-acre property and you want to give that place the best chance it's got, and as long as they're not obviously noxious weeds, yeah. but, um, yeah, just let them do their thing. Yes. And... If need be, slash them down before they flower and just let them go through the cycles. 
Yeah. That's some of the, the most simple fundamental stuff you can do. And I've had plenty of opportunity over the years to um, to go into properties with uh, you know the high net worth people mm. and throw a lot of money around and make some big changes. And um, so in, in that, I'm being able to step back now and go to people who haven't got the cash and just and work with them because I actually find it more fun and creative to be able to think up solutions and strategies that don't involve money, yes. which might involve a small energizer and a bit of tape. Yes. And even going back to the backyard solution um, with compaction is chickens. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what your core business is, the chicken caravan. And it's just – I say this to in a lot of permaculture courses is people tend to want to go and buy animals. Yeah. They just accumulate a lot of animals for no particular purpose. And over yeah. the years, I've written plenty of posts where I've talked about having a purpose for the animal. Yes. And, you know, we do partial pigs, but we only bring the pigs in when we want to get a job done. Yeah, yeah. And so our our property at Tarago there was 104 acres and 10% was basically dry land salinity. Mm. So in the last four years, oh, sorry, the last five years, it's gone back to 2%. And I've actually had DPI, land, local land services and others come out and consultants look at what I've been doing mm. because their solution in the old paradigm was to fence it and put trees into it. Yeah, and we could actually go down the road and look where that had been done. Mm. It actually got worse. Yeah, yeah. Because you, what you can do in a coastal environment like where I am now, you can't do up in a, in a higher climate like that because of um, what Alan Savory talks about—the brittleness scale. Mm. So distribution of rainfall across a twelve-month period. Yeah. So where I am at Tarago, we're at probably six hundred, seven hundred mil rainfall area, but the UK is a similar rainfall. But it's always lush and green. Yes. Because the distribution of rainfall across a 12-month period is even, where yeah. ours is very erratic. That's right. We could get it all in one month some years. That's it. <laughs> and yeah, yeah and, and none for the next 14 months. If you look so there are lots through. of factors yeah. within choosing that piece of land and putting the animals down and going, well, so what I did basically to, 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 to uh, what, how we got back to that sort of 2% um, ground, uh, dry and salinity was um, I used some machinery, so I got a yeoman's plough in and deep ripped the areas. I then put the pigs in to uh, turn it all up. Yep. So I'd throw, you know, I'd throw um, activated corn and things like down on the ground and get them to root it up and turn it over. But we move them in the nets. Yes. We move them around to the areas. Yeah. And then we got the chickens in to basically scratch it back down. So again, behind the nets, moving them around. Yep. And then uh, beyond that, we bring some cattle in. So we put hay down those areas, that's the ground cover, yep. thrown seed underneath, and again, high disturbance of the hoofs, yep. can, pushing that hay into the ground and high manure, and boom, these little islands of fertility has popped up. And then when you took the cattle out, how long did you leave it for? And it's obviously different for different parts of the farm, but I think that's what some people, they miss. They see, oh, there's these new shoots of grass come up, let's put something on it. Tell me about yeah. what happened. You took the cattle out. What happened then? I'm not going to tell you okay. because it, this, and this is the reason why and yeah. this is where people get frustrated is they want the recipe, the secret sauce. Yes. And there is no secret sauce. And the secret sauce is really for your own area is doing test areas and seeing yeah. what's going to work. Yeah. You know, if I put the cattle in now, don't just put the cattle in the whole area. Yeah. Put them into a part of an area and keep another part as a, as a test area. Yes. And see, okay, well, I'm going to leave that for a bit longer. How is that going to work? Yes, observation. Does that make sense? Observation, yeah. yeah. I, I suppose yeah. more more the point I was trying to make, you took the cows out and you let it rest. And I think that sometimes um, it, it's easy to go, I like the your, your yeoman's ploughed, the pigs have come in, the chickens come in, the cows yeah. have come in, you've put the seed down. Now, in some parts, it's looking so lush, let's get some livestock back in there. Go, well, hang mm. on. Let's let it recover. Let's get it back to the thing of like let it rest. And I yeah. myself, I don't consider myself a cell grazing expert. I've just hung around with a lot of people that are good at it. So my thing yeah. is, the most amount of animals on the smallest size period of the smallest area for the yeah. shortest period of time. Lots of mm. animals, small space, 
don't have them there very long. And, and, uh, and with the chickens, a lot of people of what I do of like have them in the nets. And the most important part of when you move the nets is that recovery. Yes, the chickens are there now, but just through the fence where they just were, don't put anything on that. Let those new shoots of grass come up. I'll go that yesterday's mm. square. That's what's going to grow your farm. Look yep. after that. Yes, mm. the chickens are, and keep them moving. But <clears throat> sometimes, especially as you know, for people that are brand new farming, you go, okay, you teach them, you move the chickens, move the chickens. And, and they're thinking the importance for the chickens. And yes, it is. Keep the yep, chickens sure. on grass. But almost the most important thing is that recovery square. Protect that because that's yep. next month, next year, next decade's worth mm. of farming. The chickens are going to be gone in so many years, but that your land is still going to be there. So that whole, give it some rest, give it some recovery time. And this is what I, I talk to most people about is, um, it's kind of like sailing. And I haven't done a lot of that over the years, but sort of the, the fundamentals are simple. You know, you've got your keel in the water and your rudder in the water and the sail up and you're actually pointing the boat where you want to go. Or you're actually, you know, you're tacking and, and getting across the ocean and yeah. using the, the wind to your advantage. Yeah. Where most people sort of see the sails up but there's no rudder or keel in the water and it's getting blown everywhere. Mm, yes. Because, you know, fundamentally here it's um, we're selecting the plants. Our recovery is actually selected by the – our plants are selected by the recovery. So if we have short recoveries, we're going to have plants that tend to want to have short recoveries. Like around here, Kaikuyu, particularly in that sort of bigger valley area, dairy country, mm. it just gets – it can handle getting smashed all the time because yes. it's rhizomal. Yes. But when you look at your more of your big sort of fescuey perennials, um, or your hardy, hardy like kangaroo grasses and, and coxfoot, things like that, um, then they're all going to have different times to recover. Mm. So you're, you're actually going to select for what you want by the time of recovery. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So the, uh, this is such a broad subject. Yes, and it is. <laughs> what, going back to that whole 50 acres. Yeah. Um, being able to control is a big thing. Yeah. Being able to control, you know, the fences from not facing inwards. Mm. Um, with our farm now, we're actually going to that westerns fencing, so electric fencing right around the ba the boundary, the whole okay. boundary. Yeah. Um, people are using a lot successfully up our way for dog control. Okay. Um, for pigs. Yeah. But we're going the big high fencing just to keep the kangaroos and deer out because. Yeah. Some some years I've been up that way, and the kangaroos are becoming a, a massive problem. Yeah, huge problem. Yes. I mean, we, they've got opportunity. We've 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 made them paddocks. Yes, we've put in water points for them. They can. They're basically on big resorts. <laughs> they are. They are on resorts. Yeah. When you think of it, it's like they've got the ability to jump fences and go. This is great. I'll yeah. just I'll just choose the best of it. <laughs> There's a trough yeah. over there or a dam now, and yeah. yeah. So it's either kangaroos or, or, or neighbours' animals wanting to get in. Yes. And so I've, I've done the, 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 the maths and the calculations, and some winters we've gone, or some even autumns we've gone into good autumn growth, and then going, okay, there's about five 6,000 um, kilos of dry matter per hectare in that paddock. Perfect. Mm. We've got enough to go through winter and, and with all the other paddocks. Yeah. Then halfway through winter, the, the, the roos move in. Mm. We go from five to 6,000 down to 1,000. Wow. Yeah, and that's not too far off being, um, you know, well overgrazed. Yeah, and it's interesting you said you do the figures because one thing I, I like teaching is the the cost benefit analysis. Like someone asks you a question, oh, should I buy an egg grader? Should I buy a tractor? Yep. Should I buy this? And it's like, just go. What's the benefit in dollars it's going to bring you and what does it cost? And there's been a, a few times, like, everyone loves to buy a new tractor, but I've talked people out of getting a tractor. I'm like, okay, you're going to get a tractor. What are you going to use it for? Well, I'll um, maybe put a bit of gravel on the road and sort of some wishy-washy answers. And it's like, mm. so is that going to bring you $30,000 in? It's like, no. Do you think you could just get a contractor in for those few days? Like, yeah, like, don't get a tractor. Like, let's get it down, down the track sometime. But... Yeah. Um, it's great hearing you say I've done the figures and, and I'm seeing more and more farms putting up that perimeter fence they've done their numbers and gone yes yeah. it's going to cost a lot of money at the moment yeah. but I can actually look at the timeline that's going to be the point of return where it, it's neutral and then it's mm. profitable afterwards so yeah that's fantastic yeah. I um, just in terms of 
the, the variables. So again, back to the landscape function. If I've got outside influences coming in um, to eat that grass down, mm -hmm. then in holistic management grazing, you can allow for that. Mm -hmm. But I'm just sort of seeing the the more mouths, the more the grass grows, the more the mouths that come in to eat the grass. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And I, look, I'm I'm in no ways anti wildlife. Um, I believe there are areas for those when you set those aside yeah. because in, when we set those aside, they'll actually self-govern, they'll actually self-regulate. Yes. Yeah. As opposed to now, we, we open the resort up and they can all just come and go as they please. Mm. One thing that I, I have been doing a lot of work, just not just in that whole um, blog post about the compaction and also the grass grounds of the road, is I just finished a, a blog piece which I put out not long ago which was sort of more of an antagonistic type um, blog post around um, farm trees and I have been planting thousands of trees for, for a while now and um, I work with a great guy in Canberra, Matt Kilby from Global Land Repair. So Matt, you may people listening or, or watching may know him um, by the Pink Tree Guards, um, quite well known in Canberra and the southern part of Australia here. But um, I've been working with him for a long time and on different projects and and me questioning what we were doing around what trees we were planting. You know, I did some work around um, Marysville after the fires in Victoria after Black Saturday and places like that. And I read a lot of David Holmgren's work, who was one of the co-originators of permaculture, um, about fireproofing um, human habitats with farms with food growing systems are human habitats as far as houses were concerned too and it got me to thinking all these grants that I've got over the years from local land services and other government grants we've got have all advocated for planting native trees but we want to grow European animals we want to grow European grasses but yet they're making us plant Australian native trees and I'm just going well, what's I just just question it what, why are we doing this mm. And our talk before the interview here, we're talking about, about the fires, how we've been impacted down here. Mm. Um, and it's quite a touchy subject. And I've got some interesting um, feedback from it so far. And it's not so much people going, you know, you're a, um, you're a native, na uh, you know, an exotic fascist. I'm not. I'm like, we want to do these things that are European, but we want to try and grow it in a totally foreign environment. Mm. to that yeah. and then after the fires here and seeing what's been destroyed particularly in farm trees have been these massive corridors of native trees have gone up mm. but yet all the exotics that have been planted are being impacted because they re retarded the fire and the fires has gone around them yes there's plenty of documentation out there especially after the Victorian fires the Black Sabbath fires where they saw that these old farmhouses have been planted out with all these European trees. Mm. Yeah, the fire killed the trees off and retarded them, but it retarded the fire. The fire had gone around and the fire kept moving yes. up into blue gum plantations where they just went up like, like candles. Yes. Know? And so I've written this blog post about um, putting in fertility building trees, not exotic trees. I'm just yeah. uh, calling it fertility building trees. Like, that could be anything, you know? Yes. I refuse, I planted, I'll, I'll say this, I planted a few gums on my property, but out of the percentage of plants I've planted, they'd probably be 1% or 2% of yeah, gums. Right, okay. Yeah. So I've been planting things like um, last season, I planted um, bunions, purely looking down the path, 60, 70 years in the path, and having that big protein source there and carbohydrate source with the nuts that come off them. Yep. Oak trees. Yep. Oaks. Um, there's a book out there, I don't know, I forget the name now, but um, a lady overseas who wrote it. Um, and basically, oak's becoming, I suppose, the next wheat crop, you know, as far as making flour and other, and, and basically using them as a, as a food source. Yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. We, and we all know that they're, they're, they're great for, um, for pigs. Um, any farmer who does pigs knows that um, acorns are a fantastic feed source for, for pigs. They love them. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and I've just been bringing up a whole heap of things that, that aren't the status quo, that aren't mm. off the nursery list or the local land services list of what you've got to plant. And so I can't do that within my funding sources, but I can actually go out and do my own thing yes. and plant my own trees. So with some of those trees, 
how do how are they affected by fire? Like, are any of those trees killed by fire? Because I know there's there's plantations in America, like I don't know, it might have been Christmas tree plantations or something. Like yeah. this was years ago. The fires went through, and it kills the trees. And in Australia, I'm just like, what? Because I'm just used to eucalypts. Fire comes through, and it, it yeah goes again. So, are any of your trees actually going to be killed by fire, or not the case? I'll tell you in about 100 years, I suppose. Okay, true. Okay. <laughs> but, you know, even looking at – I was at a consultation up um, north of Goulburn again a while back uh, for a past student of mine, mm. and she lives in a place called Crookwell. And we started – the first thing when we're looking at a farm, particularly at designing a small acreage, is we look at a, a number of different things like access, you know, um, and we do our sector analysis, which is looking at all of the environmental factors that come into it, and fire is a big one. Yeah. One thing for me is how do you get out, right? Yeah. The second thing is, you know, if we're going to, to, to build here, what can we do plant-wise? What are our sectors where the mm. fire could potentially come through? Yeah. And so we're going through some – there's things like, probably aren't so well-loved, but Hawthorne and Privet, which were on the boundary. Mm. And I'm like, well, you know, if we actually planted a line of agapanthus along there, mm. agapanthus attract a lot of snails, bring some ducks in to eat the snails. You've got a food source there for the, for the ducks. Yes. Um. <clears throat> And so agapanthus in that stage, while it needs to be kept hydrated, as yeah. soon as that grass fire would come through from the paddock next door, yeah. we'd just simply retard it. Yes, yeah. And to stop it because it's herbaceous. Yeah. And so it's looking at these plants, looking at – in permaculture, we talk about um, designing from, um, from, um, uh, from a functional point of view. How is that, how's that, how's that one element going to provide multiple functions? Mm. So in, in with that, I'm looking at trees, particularly farm-wise, is are we just planting them? And this is where it can become, in land care set, it's a very lineal approach. We're just going to plant a single row of trees or two, three rows of trees in, yep. say, a five-metre space, yep. block this bit out. Mm. And you look at it, and, and people who are listening now, just when you're driving next tomorrow or today, is look at the trees that are doing really well and where they are. Are they in a really big wide space mm. or are they in this little narrow band called a tree lane? Yes. And so is that tree lane going to provide stock shade, wind protection, stock fodder, a wildlife refuge? These are going to become, my thinking is they've got to become paddocks. They've yeah. got to go from five metres mm. to 30 metres at minimum. Yes. Right? I just planted one at my farm, which was um, which is 300 metres long yeah. by 30 metres wide. Yes. Okay. It's another paddock. Yeah. It really is. Mm. And so... I'm now in the process the next couple of years of planting just the pioneer species. So I'm going to go and plant through things that are going to be quite hardy and build a canopy up so I can get other trees and things in between. So I'm planting things like acacias. I'm planting things like hakeas, banksias, the stuff that's native, but it's providing other functions too. It's, it's actually providing um, bee forage. It's providing protection for the smaller birds to come in and follow those corridors through the farm. Mm. So pest protection is providing multiple functions as opposed to just one lineal thing. Yes. Does that make yeah. sense? Yeah, and I find it fascinating just when you started talking about like um, trees that are, um, yeah, like a fire retardant or, or whatever the wording is because it's yeah. just this week I've been looking around um, and I, I was looking at frangipanis. I've lived at a few houses and we've had a, a beautiful frangipani tree and then... Yeah. It's got the massive foliage in summer, great, great shade tree, but it's almost a succulent. Like if you break a fringe yeah. of penny, like it's almost like dripping with sap and whatever. Yeah. Yes, it drops its dry leaves in, in the winter, but it's dropping them coming into winter, so it's probably not um, going to be a fire issue, but they're a very soft leaf. Like you can just go over with a mower and, and, sh- and smash them up. And it's interesting, yeah. I was literally thinking about this th- this week, I'm going... Rather than having a boundary of I don't know what I'm not I'm not a horticulturist so I don't know all my trees but I was just looking yeah. at these fringe pennies and like why couldn't I put them through a, a system because I'm like I haven't seen like a fringe penny tree go up in smoke and go look at this thing burnt it just doesn't happen so I, yeah. I'm really loving your thinking on that to go let's think about these things what are a few things that don't burn and I know my grandmother she's she's still alive and and their property in in Sydney, my grandmother, she's 97, about to turn 98, um, and it's opposite the National Park. So they've got valleys of um, 
in Barara from the Hawkesbury River right up to Barara yep. and when that goes up that valley sure. goes up it goes up in about nine minutes yeah so my grandfather he he planted banana trees all on the front boundary like banana trees they're full of water and so long mm. as you keep the, the leaves trim like the dead leaves yeah. it's like that might just save the house now in those years that the the house is over 100 years old like they've ne- never lost in a fire but yeah. it's more just as you said just looking at it differently going hang on what have i got have i got like a, a big diesel tank sitting at my front door <laughs> i a, yeah. a very flammable tree or do i have a yeah. frangipani or a banana tree or something else so yeah um hopefully just that can make people think before they plant that eucalyptus at the back door and go this will be a great shade tree and i'll be cleaning up my gutters every weekend <laughs> to go well, look with, is there something else the thing too with fertility building trees is you know Ukes are notoriously bad. Um, they're bad for the. What's we're looking for here? Um, nutrient cycling. Yeah. They're just poor. Mm. They when the water's in, they'll suck it right up. Yeah. And as soon as the water's gone, those drop all their leaves. You know. Yeah. yeah. Um, and those leaves don't do anything. Mm. They really don't do anything at all. Yes. Um. And so when I look at European trees, and this is why I'm not prejudiced to uh, opening up my eyes to what else is out there. Mm. There's nothing better in in summer when seeing, you know, avenues of of poplars or willows and they're just this dense, thick green and got these leaves which are sheltering the ground where the eucalyptus tend to turn their leaves, you know, away from the sun so that they don't lose too much water. Mm, Yes. And lets the sunlight through. Yeah. Um, You know, I've just read this book. um, I did this before... Christmas, it's um, Regenerating Country by um, Stephen uh, Murphy. Um, great book. And I actually emailed him afterwards. He's a, he's a nurseryman from Victoria. And some quite notable people have actually given him the fun thumbs up here. One in particular, uh, Rowan Reed, who's um, a master tree grower down in Victoria, and he's quite a, um, written some great books too. Um, so I read this from cover to cover, and I emailed him back. And because I've read things like, Bill Gamage, I've read Bill, um, Bruce Pascoe and looking at how the landscape was pre-1788, call it pre-1788. And um, it was a highly managed landscape. It really was. Mm. And it's kind of like I said someone the other day, it's kind of like um, you've had a nice house which you've, you've had people looking after and manicuring the gardens for you and all of a sudden you've just been kicked out. And in that process of getting kicked out, someone's come back 50 years later and gone, well, Geez, I wonder what it looks like. I wonder what it did look like. You know, we can mm. see remnants of what might have been there, but we don't yeah. actually know what it really looked like. Yeah. We have indications of what it may have looked like, but what are we, how are we recreating country? And yeah. I th- and it's a very good book. Don't get me wrong. I've, as you can see, the amount of <laughs> post notes in there. Yeah. I've been right through it from cover to cover. But one thing that really stuck with me in here um, was about the. He says in here about um, as these systems, so he talks about, as I mentioned before, about having these massive wide tree systems as opposed to these little windbreaks. Yeah. Um, but he says in that as these native tree systems get bigger and mature, they actually lose fertility. And I'm like, well, if compaction is our biggest problem, keeping fertility in the, pro- in the soil and the soil carbon is a problem, and we're trying to grow European animals, then what advantage is there in, in our spaces our agricultural regenerative agricultural spaces mm. why are we trying to recreate country on them mm. you know as i see on the front cover you've got sheep and and kangaroos cohabitating together yeah you know i i don't know i just i just um when i when i read that i emailed him i hadn't had a, actually had time to, to i actually want to talk about the phone because it's easier to talk as we are now to get yes. in a conversation yeah than it is to sit there punching out an email and someone gets the shits because you've said something wrong and they're blowing up and it's just like it just doesn't you cannot get that rapport with a person mm. so i haven't done it yet but then i i get another book and this is a um this is a booklet actually by a farmer named john weatherston and i know john for quite a few years and he's got a farm we had a farm actually um named linfield park which is just a, a little place called gunning north of canberra um and you look him up you can actually get this book on, online and look it up and you know there's photos in here of cattle underneath honey locusts, like um, savanna plantings of honey locusts. Mm. And 
it's he, he's planted heaps of natives, but he's done it in the right fashion. Mm. And when you look at this place, it's just so diverse. Yeah. Fertility building trees. He's got, you know, and, and on our farm, we've got heaps of microlina. So microlina is quite a high protein native grass. It's called weeping grass. Yep. It hates heaps of sunshine. It loves the dappled light. Mm. Like even now in a, in a dry season, we've still got green microlina underneath these underneath our trees because of that dappled light. So look at those sort of two areas here where you've got a farmer who back in the 80s was in a dust bowl but by the late 90s 2000s is in this highly productive area mm. <coughs> with diverse trees and, and animals um what are we doing our 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 funding and direction with government is just this linear approach of um these are our trees this is what we're going to do we're going to reforest the place yeah but when you talk to people like um you know, Graham Hand from Holistic Management, mm. you know, grasslands are going to sequester far more carbon quickly than planting a whole heap of trees are. Yes, yeah. You yeah, know? It, it is the the interesting approach, but, yeah, from a government point of view, and we won't <laughs> necessarily go down yeah. that, it can be, well, it, no. t- it ticks a box. Well, it's got to be native, obviously. Um, sure. And we've ticked the box, move on sort of thing. So, yeah, but it, it is... And like this interview, I want people just to go, hang on, let's look at that from a different perspective. And I think so long as we can deliver that to go, yeah, why are we planting eucalypts? Is there something better for my particular farm, for the vision and purpose that I'm, what I'm trying to achieve? So wildlife aren't don't discriminate. I mean, I've seen plenty of wildlife (laughs) up in pine trees. The cockatoos just tear them apart, pull the seeds out and tear them apart. Yeah. Um, you know, I've seen plenty of wildlife on various different things, especially like with the um, – in Bega, like around Bega, there's some 100-year-old um, red oaks and English oaks and things, and the um, galages come in and tear, tear the nuts apart. They love it. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. so people say to me, oh, but, you know, they haven't got the natural food. Well, when you look at an urban setting and you look at what birds are in an urban setting, if you're planting grevilleas in there yeah. and grevilleas aren't endemic to where, your area, you're actually yeah. extending the actual habitat for which that bird can exist. Mm. That bird can then become a problem because you've extended its its, its area and its range. Yes, yeah. And that, and this is a whole different argument again about what do, do we and don't we plant. Mm. And I very much believe in protecting areas, and this is one big thing that's come up for us too now is within <clears throat> trade systems out there in the national parks, do we just lock them up? Mm. Because you've taken the, you've virtually taken the interaction between animals and man and the bush out of it, mm. and it's the same with our small ecosystems on our, on, a, on our own piece of land. How we need to sort of, I suppose, step back and look at it from that, that get a different lens here, and as you said before, ask those questions: What climate am I in here? Am I in a, in a coastal climate, or am I in a, in a um, Mediterranean climate? Am I in a cold, cold, temperate climate? Do I get snow? And you can't just go, well, we're going to bring permaculture over here, we're going to put it, block it in here, and we're going to bring this over here and block it in here because it's just, it won't work. Yeah, yeah. You, you for, you're forcing function. And, and like you said earlier, it's um, sometimes we, we just want the answer. Like, just give me the cookie cutter. Like, what's the solution? Like, mm. h- how many cattle can I have on 50 acres? <laughs> and it's not. It is different. And even farms, as you know, like they can be one kilometre apart and they're t- totally different farms like uh, as you said the neighboring property this one's going to get the water and well all this water is going to go in there so well yeah, they, they can one climb apart they can be like 2.5 millimeters apart you know true that's that right. far apart and yes. I've, st- I've got boundary photos of my mm. place and other pl- neighboring places yeah some families who have been on that land for 200 years yes and i'm standing in grass up from waste with in shorts going geez i hope there's no bloody snakes around here mm. and then seeing the fence talking to them and they're back in the tractor out mid-december yeah um feeding cattle and i'm just like what what don't you see yes yeah yeah what you, 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 you must don't... have been lucky you must have got a lot more rain <laughs> but this is the same paddock it's the same bit of floodplain yeah same i know i know it's more just sometimes the mindset of like he's got plenty of grass well I don't know, he, he must have received a bit more rain or the sometimes justify it rather than stopping and going, hang on, what can I learn here? Uh, rather than sometimes the mindset, well, Dad did it this way, Granddad did it this way, I should continue doing it this way. Um, yeah. yeah. So my, I've got family down in um, 
Daniel Warrigal in, in Victoria. So this time last year, um, they were burnt out. Their farm got basically, in, in April last year, I drove down that way, it was just like it is here now, just mm-hmm. smoky, dry, and like a dust bowl. Yeah. Now that they're on their second cut of hay for the season. Yeah. And, you know, they don't subscribe to what I subscribe to. Mm. Um, they purely subscribe to the um, stock and station agent telling them when to run stock and what to put on. And yeah. my uncle's a mechanic and my auntie works for a glass company, you know. Mm. They're not farmers by any means. They've learned a lot as they've gone on, but they rely yeah. on the people who are selling them stuff to tell them, tell them what to put on. Yeah. Where f- for me, um, it would have been, geez, let's just give that land some rest. You just extraction, like it's extraction mining. You've It's been devastated. Mm. 12 months later, you've got some rain, you've got your grass growing, you're just cutting the guts out of it again. Like, yeah, and, and, and export, give it a break. Exporting it somewhere else, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. Well, mostly they're, they're feeding the, the hay to, to on the on the property. But oh, okay, yeah. Again, it's like it's like the the tool. How do we use that tool? Do we go and cut that grass and stockpile it in the shed, mm. right? Yeah. Or do we get animals in there and put the the right animals at the right place at the right time for the right yeah. reasons mm. and graze them? So we we cut the middleman out, which has been the haymaker. Yes. And we get the animals onto the right position for the right time. Yeah, yeah. Management and timing, isn't it? It's a management drought. Yeah. And yeah. that's what I think, it, it, you know, we can scream and bitch and moan about what we want, about um, about how this drought's... But it's, again, I, I know farmers are out there now that, uh, you know, that aren't going great guns, but they're certainly not underwater. Hmm. Yeah. They know where they're at. And I just yeah. saw a story the other day by um, Charlie Massey, you know, who's just written the book called The, uh, the Rewarbler and running around at the moment all over the world talking about regenerative agriculture. And he's at a point now where he's got a bloodline, which he really has to go, well, is it the landscape that's important here or is it keeping the bloodline? Mm. If the sheep to get going, you know, to keep going. Yeah. Do I punish the landscape and keep the sheep or do I move them off or sell them off? Mm. Yeah. Again, it's a, it's a management thing. Yeah. We just don't have those. And again, I... Um, we talked about before we the interview started. We talked about um, who who are we aiming at here, and who are these people listening to this podcast and others like it. The as I've got done plenty of permaculture design courses and other courses in the Canberra area, which has been there's been like a mass defection out of IT sort of um, jobs in Canberra just because they know that the writing's on the wall. Mm. Their jobs aren't going to be there in the future. They're going well. We want to get back to being more on the land yeah and they're either very open to ideas or they're very they lock onto one thing mm. and that's why they, they keep going down yeah that approach where if you can get them and the person with the 50 acres who wants to do something good is yeah. we'll look at um what are our needs to start with before going out there trying to um save the world with regenerative agriculture is actually can we come back yeah to providing for ourselves to start with and then selling whatever surplus off, whether it be eggs, whether it be beef or whatever, yeah. to others around us. Because, as you know, farming can be a bloody tiring pursuit, that's for sure. It's every day. Chickens don't stop laying on Christmas Day, do they? No, they don't. <laughs> yeah. do, you tell it to, do you say it to people when you when you sell the chicken caravan to them? That, oh. you know, you, yeah, I, I, this I, is I, not the... I, I tell them what's involved. There's been plenty of times to say... Well, probably as you have as well. Go. This isn't. This probably isn't going to work for you. Or yeah. Um, and in some times where they're like, oh, let's go get three or four of them. We go. <laughs> no, you probably don't need three or four. Um, yeah. And things have probably changed because I've done more podcasts and videos to probably explain more context. But in the early days, I'd have people to go. Have done a little bit of research. Probably key word. I, yeah. I, I want twelve, fifteen thousand birds. And, and I, yep. after a quick conversation, why do you want 15,000? Well, I've done my figures. I'm like, well, what if I could show you how to have 2,000 birds and earn the same income as the guy yep. that owns 15,000 birds? Go, mm. Okay. And we do a bit of stuff and we normally deliver that for them. It's like, yep. do your marketing right, do your distribution right. The difference between selling your eggs for $6 a dozen and seven fifty, and that's often at the farm gate, Shane and Marnie yep. Ellis, Apple Box Farm, yeah, the, the six dollars a dozen versus seven fifty that doubles someone's income. So someone here sure. is selling fifty gram worth of eggs. 
Yeah. The same number of eggs for seven dollars fifty. That's hundred thousand dollars. And they go, yeah. oh, okay, right. <laughs> so, yeah, there's. But as as you're talking about, yeah, workload. Yeah, it it, it is every day, and it mm. comes down to what you want to achieve. Like some some people, you think, oh, you obviously are getting chickens because you want an income. As you know, it's often sometimes they've looked through everything, go. I want to improve my land. I will get chickens, and eggs just happen to be the byproduct. <laughs> yeah. So there's so many reasons, um, and there's other people go. I've got the hundred acres. Granddad made a living out of beef cattle. I just simply can't. But I want to show my kids we can make an income in case mm. they decide they want to stay on the family farm. So they will bring in chickens and some other smaller enterprises, just so that to provide an opportunity for the kids and the kids go no we don't want it no worries but they go I actually do want it and I've now seen an example and I can be mentored into that so mm. the, there's so many so many different re- reasons but yeah it, it, it can be a tough game and it, that's why it is important I was speaking to Charlie Arnott recently he was saying like, what's your vision what's your mm. mission understand why you're doing that so when the alarm clock goes off early in the morning you're going to roll back into bed you go Yep. Hang on, I'm doing this because, and if you don't have a good enough reason, whether it's farming or any other pursuit, whether you're getting up early to swim to train for the Olympics, if you don't have that reason, you know, mm. yeah, hit the snooze button. We'll give that project away. So that's it. And like I, you know, even now, like I find myself getting up at three thirty-four in the morning and just getting out and punching out a, a, a blog. It's got something on my mind. I just want to get it out there. Mm. Um, but I'm bounding out of bed. Yes. Because I know, like even now where we are, um, amongst this this fire at the moment, mm. I know on the other side of that is um, it's gonna the cycle will continue. It'll be green again soon. Yes. And imagine, I just think about too. I said to people in the last couple of weeks, just imagine if this is a wet summer. Yeah. You know, people would be oblivious to what's going on at the moment. They wouldn't even care. They mm. would. You know, this is the whole thing about regenerating landscapes. Yeah. It's the difference between. Bush regen, right? Yeah. Bush regen, I see, is a, it's a process. They go, well, we think we know what it looked like, and we're going to go and restore it. Yeah. But when we do restore it, weeds come back and plants die. Why is that? Mm. Because we haven't looked at the landscape function. Yeah. We actually haven't gone, well, here's how the landscape works. Here's how it functions, right? If we look at increasing the water cycle, the mineral cycle, which is the incorporation of these four things, yeah. then it's like a four-legged chair it's it's balanced. Yes. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for sure. So we go and try and bush region over here, we try and save the world, yeah. and then all of a sudden we have to keep managing that system because it won't look after itself. Mm. But in a in a regenerative system, we look at the four landscape functions and go, if we keep those things in balance the yeah. best that we can yeah. and manage those things, then it will c- keep regenerating. Mm. Yeah. yeah. People say to me all the time with my business name, Regenerative Landscapes Australia. Yeah. They they look at it and go, Oh, do you do landscape? I said, No, I don't do landscaping. Yeah. I actually <laughs> set up landscape function landscape so they can actually function properly. Yes. And yeah. put the management and all those sort of things into place mm. so it will function nicely, you know. Yeah. And then and having the testing matrix, like Dave Tong will actually come up with a testing matrix which looking at a piece of land and actually testing it and going, Well, your landscape is at X and then it's at Y. We that's where it is now yeah. in the future if we know we're going forward we can test that bit of landscape again and look at its function yeah. infiltration plants all that type of thing and know we're moving forward yes yeah I think Gabe, Gabe Brown in his book um, he's the uh, the cover cropping guru from um, from uh, the US and he's in a rainfall situation a lot less than what we are up at Tarragon I think he's in probably at two or three hundred mil rainfall with a mm. fair bit of snow through the year yeah but um He's just growing amazing. His his infiltration went from like an inch every couple of hours to like inches in minutes yes, of water. Yes, I, th- I think I I was reading about someone. I think it could have been Gabe. So yeah, yeah the yeah. amount of yeah, it can just absorb water. So just like a sponge, and that's yeah. what I'm doing is creating landscape sponges. Yes, to take that water up, but don't they don't rob it from the next door neighbour. No, which actually over time starts to return it slowly, yes. as it should do. Yeah, through through the soil. Mm. Yeah, 
I'm gonna I'm gonna have to wrap this up. We could we could talk for, for hours. But let's, I warned you, didn't I? Yeah, let yeah. We'll, we'll do what we'll do. We'll do a follow up call in um, in another couple of months. So I'll have a look at some of the topics from from some of those um, articles that you're going to be releasing soon, and yeah. and we'll do it do a follow up call because it's quite fascinating and. I've, I've very much appreciated chatting today and I hope we've provided a lot of value for our listeners. So thanks for your time today, Nick. Love it. Thanks, mate. <laughs> See you later.